Um, great. Uh, without further ado, uh, welcome to the Zuma Scientist series. So this series is sponsored by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, UVM Extension, and SUNY Plattsburgh's education program known as Watershed Alliance. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of the Lake Champlain Basin. Watershed Alliance aims to reach K-12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York. The Zuma Scientist series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programs. Every Tuesday and Friday from now until the end of June, we will be hosting a guest scientist to tell us more about their research in the basin. Just as a heads up, uh, this webinar is currently being live streamed to our YouTube channel and all of our past presentations, this one and future presentations will be archived there for use later um, by students or teachers or for you to share with folks who you think might be interested in some of the topics we've been covering. Um, uh, join me in welcoming today's presenter, uh, Rosie Chapina, a, PD, a PhD candidate from the University of Vermont. Uh, Rosie is working with Dr. Jason Stockwell on mycid ecology, specifically on evaluating mycid behavior and migration patterns. Prior to UVM, Rosie attended the University of Texas at El Paso, uh, where she obtained her bachelor's degree in forensic science. Rosie has worked on marine, uh, estuary, and now freshwater mycids. Today, uh, Rosie will be delivering a presentation titled Small but Powerful, Understand Understanding the Daily Vertical Migrations of Mycid Shrimp in Lake Champlain. When you think of animal migration, what comes to mind? Many animals, including monarch butterflies, fish, and birds, migrate every year for different reasons. Mycids are shrimp-like organisms that remain at the very bottom of Lake Champlain during the day and migrate up through the water column at night. Mycids can grow up to one inch and migrate more than 200 feet in one night. Uh, so thanks for joining uh, us and Rosie today. Rosie, uh, I'm gonna turn it over for, to you now. Uh, so if you wanna share your screen and, and pull up your presentation and take it away. Hi everyone, I'm trying to get this ready for you all. Let's see, where can I? Um, there we go. Thank you, Nate. Yeah, you Hi bet. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Nate, for that introduction and thank you everyone for joining me. I'm gonna be talking about uh, vertical migrations in, in mice shrimp in Lake Champlain. So like I said, thank you so much for joining me. And so first off, what are mycids? And so um, that's like a question I we usually get very often. You don't really hear the word mycids. So mycids are large zooplankton and zooplankton are small organisms, aquatic organisms, and they are microscopic. So you need a microscope to see them. And so mycids are, 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 are just large zooplankton and they actually eat smaller zooplankton. They eat sand and phytoplankton. So phytoplankton, uh, they get their energy from the sun. So they're very, very small organisms. And so mycids have a two-year life cycle. Their life cycle, so how long, the, how long they live, is usually dependent on how productive a lake is. And so that usually has a lot to do with how, how, fast, how fast a mycid can grow. And so right here we have a female mycid. And so mycid actually carry their embryos in their little pouch. And so as, as you see right here, that this is a little pouch and they carry the embryos until they pop out. Mycids grow up to an inch. And so right, you can see in that picture, uh, I have mycids in my hand. And so they're very, very interesting critters. They're really small, but they migrate every day. And I'll talk a little bit about their migration in, on a second. So where can you find mycids? Very interestingly, mycids, you can find them in oceans, in estuaries, and in lakes. And so I've worked with mycids from the Caribbean, so from Puerto Rico, Jamaica, the Bahamas, and I've also worked with mycids 
from estuaries. So I did an internship in the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. And so I had a chance an opportunity to work with, with estuary mycids. And now I am currently working with mycids from lakes. So specifically Lake Champlain and Lake Ontario. And so they have a really wide distribution. Of course, there's different species, you know, like you won't find one species in one location. There's, they're very, very broad. And so this is a map that shows mycids that are part of a group. So they're different species, but they're all freshwater mycids. And so the way you look at this map is, so we're looking at like from the top of the globe. And so the X will show the North Pole and the shaded colors depict the different species. And so the species that I'm working on and most interesting on is Mysis diluviana, which that's, that's their name. And they are native to North America, the Northern parts of North America, and they're shaded in pink. And so this is kind of um, a map of the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain. So right here, you'll see Lake Champlain and then Lake Ontario. And so I'm working on mycids from both Lake Ontario and Lake Champlain. And so Mysis diluviana is present in all the Great Lakes and in Lake Champlain also different um, in different lakes from northern parts of Canada as well. And so when we think of migration, we think about, you know, birds migrating to the, to the south because of winter or monarch butterflies migrating from northern parts of the states all the way down to, to, to Mexico, you know, fish migrating from, from either from salt water to fresh water and vice versa. And so we think of different, like, oh, you know, they, they migrate from one different ecosystem to another, one habitat to another. And so we, we have this more of a, a migration is something big and, and, and it is, you know, it completely is. And so def, 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 definitely like different drivers of migration include food. So, you know, like organisms migrate food availability and they migrate maybe for more suitable temperatures. And so there's different reasons of why, of why you know, organisms migrate. And I'm studying a very interesting, very, very different type of migration, at least not something that we think about you know, all day or, or any, at any point of our day of, of our lives. So I'm studying diel vertical migration. And so you're like, oh, that's a, that's a big word maybe. So what diel vertical migration is, is organisms, they'll migrate up to the water column at night. And during the day, like right before the day, they don't, they'll, migrate down and stay at the bottom. And so this is called diel vertical migration. And it's very interesting because mycids exhibit DVM, exhibit diel vertical migration. So they're able to migrate at night, maybe not, not get seen by different predators. They're safer at night. And at, during the day, they're at the bottom. Mycids are actually sensitive to light and high temperatures. And so this allows them to feed in high energy sources um, in the in, up in the water column and then remain at the bottom during during the day. And so two terms that are really important that I might um, talk about is pelagic habitat versus benthic habitat. And so a benthic habitat is the very bottom. So really like let's say in the lake, the very bottom of the lake. So we see those little brown fish at the bottom. They're actually called slimy sculpin and we have them in Lake Champlain. And so they remain in the benthic habitat compared to the fish that we have up in the water column. As you see, they're alewife, and so we also have them in Lake Champlain. And so they're in the pelagic habitat. And interestingly enough, so DVM, del vertical migration, is a type of migration that different species of mycids exhibit. But in Lake Champlain, with Mycis diluviana, and in the Great Lakes, Actually, what mycids, what mycids do is that during the night, some will stay at the bottom and some will migrate. And during the day, when they come down, some remain benthic and some are suspended off the bottom. And so this is a term known as partial diel vertical migration, where some mycids stay at the bottom and some don't. And it's a very, very big question um, to understand larger, like the ecosystem in general. And so why is understanding mycid migration important? 
So this migration pattern that mice have, so like they'll migrate, they'll come down, transfer nutrients from the bottom of the lake to the top of the lake, which is very, very important because it allows you know, different nutrients to flow um, from one habitat to another. Also, mycids play a very important role in fish diets. But as you see, mycids spend time not only in the benthic habitats, but also in pelagic habitats. So that means that both fish that are in the benthic habitat and in the pelagic habitat feed on these mycids. So they play a very, very important role in fish diets. And so kind of what I'm talking about. So we, here we have these two figures. And so on your left, you'll see complete dial vertical migration. On your right, you'll see partial migration. And so what the difference is, is so like in complete DVM, in complete dial vertical migration, during the day, all the mycids remain at the bottom. So they remain, they remain benthic. And at night, they, the entire population will migrate. And what we see with, with these mycids in, in Lake Champlain and in the Great Lakes is that during the day, some are suspended off the bottom. Some you know, don't remain in, in, in benthic habitats. And during the day, some will not migrate. And so this is a very, very interesting question because you're like, well, why is it that you know, they exhibit this, this, this type of, of behavior? And so to give you an idea of where mycids are placed in, in the food web. And so you, you'll see the circle of possum shrimp. Opossum shrimp, they have the name because they actually carry the embryos in a pouch. And so that's where, where, they, where they are in the food web. And so how the food web works is so you have your algae, so at the very bottom of the food chain. It, so calanoids, which are smaller zooplankton, will eat the, the algae and then mycids will eat the smaller zooplankton. And then you have a fish like alewife that will feed on mycids. And so it's basically who eats who. And this is a very, very well, more of a complex uh, food web, like Ontario food web. And so that's just kind of a, a way it works and then so on. And so that's kind of depicting how energy gets transferred from one place to another. So um, during last summer, we went to go, we went out in Lake Champlain to collect mycids for a pilot experiment. And so these are the little critters swimming around. So mycids do not like light, like I said, sunlight. However, they can't see red light. And so that's why they're not, they're calmly just swimming around and not panicking in a way. So they, this, this light doesn't stress mices. And so, um, yeah, they're very interesting to look at. I can just do this for, for days. So they're, they're very interesting critters. And so we know that mycids play a very important role in fish diets and they're important in the ecosystem, but then why is it that understanding their behavior? Why, why understand their behavior? And so lakes and oceans and different bodies of water are undergoing different changes. So like in Lake Champlain, we have in invasive species. So invasive species are organisms that have been introduced to a lake, so they're not native. And so in Lake Champlain, we have zebra mussels. Zebra mussels that you can see at the top. And so in Lake Ontario, we have both zebra and quagga mussels. And so these zebras are invasive species. And so what mussels do is that they filter the water. And so they're basically sucking up all the nutrients and all of the, the or, uh, phytoplankton and they're just filtering it out at a really, really fast pace. And so, that's not good for our lakes because if they're doing it, they're spreading out and they're constantly you know, sucking up the nutrients in a way other organisms that depend on, on those nutrients on that phytoplankton algae, uh, they're kind of in a way competing with them. And so right here to your left, you'll see what their quagga mussels and I collected these quagga mussels from Lake Ontario. And so you'll see that circle, we have mycids. They look like worms, but they're actually mycids. Um, and so they kind of look a little white, but that's because of the ethanol. So it kind of takes away the, the, um, the color. And so this is a figure that kind of depicts what I'm trying to explain. So it increases water clarity. So mussels at the bottom are sucking up all the nutrients and they're making the water very, very clear. 
And so you're probably like, well, and then how is this related to mycids? So mycids, even though mycids do migrate during the night, there is the water clarity is increasing. And so now when mycids migrate up, like I said, they have a, a threshold, so a maximum of, of light that they can tolerate. So they will not migrate as far up, the, up in the water column as they would with, without this change. And so overall, it, I mean, not only does it affect the food web because it's, you know, if, if mussels are getting rid of all those nutrients and all the phytoplankton, and then other organisms are not able to eat those sources, it also disrupts the migration behavior of mycids because of, of light, of moonlight. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it to Nate for the question. You got it. Um, so let's see how well you all have been uh, paying attention. So here's your first polling question. Uh, when do mycids migrate up in the water column? So uh, that is the first question. You, you should see that poll popping up on your screen. Um, so I'll give you all a moment to uh, answer uh, to the best of your abilities before uh, Rosie reveals the correct answer. So again, when do mycids migrate up uh, through the water column? Is it day or night? or day and night. Uh, so it looks like most of the answers have come in. I'll give just 10 more seconds. Uh, so make your pick. <laughs> All right. We'll go ahead and share the results. And Rosie, I'll let you uh, talk us through these results and uh, let us know the right answer. Okay, so the right answer is actually Oh gosh. Hmm. There we go. Night. So mycids migrate at night. So mycids do not like sunlight and they are sensitive to high temperatures. So during the day, you'll might see the, the warmer up in the warm, closer to the, just warming up a little bit more. So mycids don't like high temperatures and light. So they, they migrate at night. So the overarching question of my research of what I'm doing, the, my purpose in a way, is to understand like that partial dial vertical migration. So why are mycids at the staying at the bottom and not migrating at night? And so, you know, in addition, are there any differences of mycids that migrate at night or the ones that remain at the bottom? Maybe there's differences in density and biomass. So maybe there's more that migrate, maybe not. Uh, maybe it's a size factor. Is it a size factor? Um, or it's related to sex or, or life stage. And so there's many different questions of uh, that kind of can help us understand what that behavior and understand why some remain, remain benthic, remain at the bottom. And so this is a, pic a picture of, of a mycid, a female mycid, and the little, little mycids, um, ju I just pop them out to just take a picture, but uh, they'll pop out once they're ready. And so, um, and so I, I, to your, to your right, you'll see different sizes of mycids. And so some hypotheses um, of kind of drivers of, of this migration behavior is size. So, the, the bigger you are, the more you're able to, to feed on sand. So like you're big and you don't have to migrate because you've got, you're in a good place. And so you can eat sand at the bottom. So you might not migrate because you, know, you can feed on, on sand at detritus, so the very bottom. And so if you're small, you, you, you're, gonna, you're going to migrate because you need that high energy food sources in the pelagic habitat. And so you'll you'll take the trip because you want that you want that food. Predation risk. So mycids are cannibalistic, so they eat each other. And so when I was doing this was a very very interesting experience I had. I was doing research in the Chesapeake Bay, and I had these mycids and tanks. And I saw a mycid. It was a female mycid actually, um, basically just chewing off a head of a male. 
it was it was very interesting. I was very, very surprised, but they are cannibalistic. And so maybe larger um, mycids might eat the smaller ones. And so smaller ones will have to migrate. Smaller mycids are also, you know, smaller. So you, they might not be seen by predators versus a large mycid. It can be more visible um, in the pelagic habitat. And a big one also is light and temperature thresholds. So mycids, the smaller the mycid is, the less the impact it'll have on light and temperature. So smaller mycids aren't as sensitive as adult mycids to higher light levels and temperatures. So next question, I'll like let Nate take over. All right, so y'all should see uh, that next polling question popping up on your screen. Uh, so what type of mussels do we have in Lake Champlain? Oh, I launched the wrong poll, my bad. I'm gonna end that and launch the other one. <laughs> Here we go, that's the one. What type of mussels do we have in Lake Champlain? A, quagga, B, zebra, C, both zebra and quagga, or D, Lake Champlain does not have any mussels. So we'll give maybe 15 more seconds. Uh, the answers are coming in fast and furious. It looks like most folks are pretty confident in this one. Uh, so again, what type of mussels do we have in Lake Champlain? A, quagga, B, zebra, C, zebra and quagga, or D, no mussels in Lake Champlain. All right. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Rosie, what do we think? Yeah, well, so the correct answer is zebra mussels. So Lake Champlain does not have quagga mussels, um, at least not yet. It's unfortunate. You know, I think it's unfortunately a matter of time for quagga mussels to get introduced. Um, but that's why it's important to understand. And I think that's kind of my, my, my research in general. So yes, we understand what, what mycid behavior in Lake Champlain, but we also have to understand mycid behavior in, in other systems. For example, Lake Ontario would have actually both quaggas and zebra mussels. And so understanding the migration in, in Lake Ontario can help us, you know, kind of look at the consequences or understand how quagga mussels once introduced into Lake Champlain can alter alter the food web. And so now, so we know now like kind of why mices are important and you know kind of the consequences and, and overall like the overarching question of my research. And so now what gear do we use and how do you collect these mice? So I go out um, and most of my research or most of my collection has been out in Lake Ontario. And so we go and collect mice both day and night. And so they're very long days. And so to collect mycids from the pelagic habitat, so from the water column, we use a vertical mice net. And so what, what, how we use it is so we basically drop the net and it goes all the way to the bottom, maybe like two meters off the bottom and we pull it up. And so it collects all the mycids in the water column. And it's, it, it's, you know, we have to uh, collect mycids, but there's also other information we have to collect from the lake. And so we use a CTD, which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. Conductivity would be the um, electricity currents, electric currents. And we use a sucky disk. And so a sucky disk, uh, we use that to look at water clarity and so how clear the water is and it's it's a very, very simple instrument to use. You drop the sucky disc and you lower it and um, you basically just wait until you can no longer see the disc and you take a measurement and that's kind of measuring water clarity. And the last one, which is my favorite, it's, it's kind of sometimes really hard to, to maneuver, but it's the benthic sled. And so the benthic sled collects mice at the very bottom of the lake so in the benthic habitat. And so how it works is that we just, we, we drop it all the way to the bottom and it basically, we drag it for five minutes and it collects all the mycids in the benthic habitat. 
And so this is kind of a, a picture of, um, of a sucky disc. And so we have the sucky disc lowering the sucky disc. And so there's, I don't know if you can see the little tick marks in the rope and the line. And so those are the measurements that we use. They're all measured so we can look and see at, at what point does, do we stop seeing the disc. And so this is a vertical net. And so that's kind of what we use where we usually have to hose it down to collect all the mice and make sure that they, we collect all of them. And that is a benthic sled. And so if you see at the end, there's a cup, there's a white cup, and that's where all the mice get collected in. And so this is a picture of the benthic sled in action. And so we're, we're basically deploying it out and you collect mice. So those are the mice. And these mice are actually, I collect them from Lake Champlain. So I put them in my hand just to kind of give a sense of how large they can get. And so, like I said, much of my, of my collection process is in Lake Ontario. And so I, this is the RV Keho, the research vessel Keho, and it belongs to the US Geological Survey. So we collaborate with them and we collect mice together. And so it's it's very, very interesting and very fun. Not, I mean, you know, it's fun to, to just collect mice in general, but also to spend day and nights in these boats. It just brings up really good memories. Um, and there I am trying to put a, a, some sample, I think it was zooplankton into, into my sample bottle. And there I am waving at the RV Keho. So I was actually working from a smaller boat, uh, the Lake Whitefish. And so there's the, the benthic, the vertical net. And so I'll turn it over to Nate for the following question. All right, uh, thanks Rosie. So uh, again, if you wanna go out uh, and collect mycids, you're gonna need to know the answer to this question. So uh, we'll go ahead and launch it. Um, what gear is used to collect mycids that are at the bottom of the lake? Uh, so A, mycid net, B, CTD, C, secchi disc, or D, benthic sled. So we'll give, uh, you know, 30 seconds for you all to, to choose your answer. Again, what gear is used to collect mycids that are at the bottom of the lake? Uh, a, mycid net, B, CTD, C, secchi disc, or D, benthic sled. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll and share the results. All right, Rosie, take it away. So it is the benthic sled. Let's see, it's the benthic sled. So we uh, collect, the mycid net is usually, um, we, we usually use it to collect mycids in the pelagic habitat. So um, all in the water column and then we pull it up and the benthic sled at the very bottom. Although I uh, there are some instruments that they, so they use sometimes a mycid net in, in, in usually was like in the older days. So they would deploy the net all the way to the bottom and let it sit at the very bottom. And they were trying to collect both benthic and, and, and pelagic and pelagic mycids. So it's a mycid net can be, so that, that's not completely wrong. But in, you know, here in, and for our purposes and for to answer the question that we're, that we're aiming for is we use a benthic sled. And so, you know, I'm, there's so many things that, that, that I'm trying to ask and different types of analysis that I have to do. And so at this point, what we know so far, so in Lake, not only in Lake Champlain, but also in Lake Ontario, is that mycids that remain at the bottom at night tend to be, tend to be larger in size compared to the mycids that migrate up in the water column that are, are smaller. And so, uh, they tend to be juveniles, the ones that migrate at night. And so this is kind of what we know so far. There's so many like ongoing research. I'm at the point that I still have to analyze data and I still have to go through so many things to try to, to answer all these questions. And not only am I doing, um, and am, am I trying to measure my SIDS and not only, like, only this project, I'm also doing follow-up projects that will help me understand this, this, this question. And so it's kind of an ongoing process. 
And so if there are two things that you take from this, from this uh, presentation, one of them has to be that mice play a very important role in fish diets and in the lake, in lake ecosystems. And not only do they transfer nutrients from benthic to pelagic habitats, but they also, their, their, their behavior allows them to not only be in, 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 in just at the bottom, also at, at the top. So both benthic pelagic habitats. So fish can have access to, to mycids. Um, and so why is understanding their behavior important? You're like, well, you know, there are so many changes that are happening, especially in lakes, not only with like changing um, temperature, like temperatures are increasing, but invasive species are coming in and altering the food web. And it's important to see how all these changes are going to impact mycid behavior and help us predict how mycids are going to be able to respond or are they going to be able to withstand these changes. Um, so there's def definitely different uh, changing environmental conditions coming in. And so understanding mycids is very important because let's say quagga mussels come in into Lake Champlain, then what's going to happen at that point? Are, are mice is going to be able to withstand? Or even like even a bigger question is, well, what happens if mice disappear? So they, if, they're, if they all die off, like how is, is the food web going like, to look like? All the fish that depend on these mice, what's going to happen to them? You know, and, and this is kind of understanding a bigger question, which is the importance of mice in, in food webs, but also how different changes can alter that. And so they might be very small, like an inch is probably like, oh, you're just like, it's a little critter, but they play a very important role. And, you know, they're able to migrate from, so in Lake, in Lake Champlain, you can find mice at 100 meters, 60 meters. And so they migrate all the way up to like maybe 20 meters below the surface. So they're able to do that in one night, every single day. And so that's just over, overly impressive. Um, and so the, yeah, they're they're very important, and I and I I'm, I'm very passionate about what, about my work and what I do, and it's really important to kind of connect and try and to other people to to understand the importance of it. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Jason Stockwell, my advisor, Brian O'Malley, and Brian Weidel from the U U.S. Geological Survey, Lars Rustam from Cornell University, Ben, Chris, Delaney, and Anya for all those day and nights sampling in Lake Ontario, Captain Steve from Lake Champlain and Captain Terry from the USGS, Stockwell Lab and the Rubenstein School and the Great Lakes Fishery Commission for their funding. Yeah, and at this time I'll take any questions. Thank you. Awesome, Rosie. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, that was a, a really awesome presentation. Um, I particularly appreciated you talking about migration and sort of relating uh, that diel vertical migration to sort of some of the larger scale migrations that I think uh, most people are familiar with, you know, right? Uh, yeah. and kind of the, the drivers of migrations and, and, you know, that impact on sort of systems and systems thinking, you know, we think about how nutrients move and how that's related to migration of certain species. Um, so yeah, I just really appreciated your presentation. Um, so thank you again. And yeah, uh, definitely time for a short question and answer session. So um, if folks have questions, go ahead and uh, open up the Q&A box and, and place your questions in there. Um, Rosie, I have a question uh, to start us off, if, if that's all right with you. Yeah, of course. Should I stop in my my screen? That's okay. Uh, we yeah, can yeah. leave up your your thank yous. I'm sure these people <laughs> uh, all deserve some some long term broadcasting of thank yous. So no worries. Awesome. Um, so judging by your quick map that you shared of of distribution of freshwater mycids, I didn't see any freshwater mycids in Texas or California, um, and I'm wondering you know, if you want to talk through just your path as a student and as a professional and as a scientist and sort of, um, you know, your arc, if you will, uh, as much detail as you're willing to go into, um, just in terms of how you became interested in this general field of work. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about your passion for mycids uh, now, but I'm wondering what led you uh, to this point and, and how you got to, to where you are as a, as a student and a scientist and a professional. 
Thank you, Mike. That's a very great question. I think that, um, yeah, of course, there's no mices in Texas. I actually, um, so I, I was more into like, I was pursuing a, a bachelor's degree in forensic science. And the reason why is because it was a challenging uh, bachelor's uh, program that could lead me to medical school. And so I emailed a couple of professors. I wanted to get to know a little bit of experience on like um, more of research. And it turned out that one of, I, I, I admire her so much. She's a doctor in, um, in UT El Paso, UTEP. Her name is Dr. Elizabeth Walsh. She, allowed, she brought me in and um, she was like, we have this project and it's about looking at genetics in mice from Caribbeans. And so I was able to, to kind of, it was, I'm, I was more, interestly, more, more interested in the genetics aspect, of course. And so, you know, I was like, yeah, of course, you know, experiment, that's so interesting. And so I started reading about mycids and I thought it was really, really interesting. You know, it was just, I was just admire their dial vertical migration. And so then I applied to a couple internships, REUs, so research experiences for undergraduates. And I got accepted into one that's in the Chesapeake Bay. So um, um, I was able to go out and look at mice and sample mice. And so at this point, I was I still knew that I was going to medical school. I just wanted to have, you know, like fun and 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 do research. And that's that's what I thought, you know. And so um, after that, I was I I went back to school and and I realized that my passion was mice. And so I presented at I presented the work that I did in um, the Chesapeake Biological uh, Laboratory in a conference. And I met, that's where I met my advisor, Jason. And he was like, I, I explained my research and I little did I know that I was talking to one of the biggest experts in mycids. And so he gave me his card and I was like, yes, I would, I would love to, I, I will definitely apply. And so I did, I, I decided that, you know, medical school wasn't for me and that I really enjoyed mycids and they're, they're small. And a lot of people tell me, why is it that you're so passionate about these mycids? I moved from Texas, which is sunny and it's beautiful to Vermont where I was basically dying in the winter. So I definitely, I definitely feel passionate about mycids. That's really good. Yeah, if you're, uh, if you're willing to give up uh, you know, temperate winters uh, that you've grown used to and, and move up to Vermont, uh, you know, to follow and study something that you're really passionate about. That's how you know it's real, you know? <laughs> right, yeah, no, yeah. And I, I, I had no, I really, I only took my senior year. That's when I realized that I wanted to pursue um, a career in ecology. That's when I took my first ecology class. I had taken biology, organismal biology, but I was like, well, I have to catch up. You know, I have to, and most of my classes were like endocrinology and just, you know, different type of classes. So I had to get it going. So, so yeah. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I, uh, I appreciate that arc. That's, that's uh, quite a journey uh, to where you are now. So it's always cool to, to see how people evolve, you know, in like, I'm sure I'm going to go to medical school and be a doctor. And then all of a sudden, you know, one door opens and it just leads to, uh, you know, a whole different field. Um, so we have yeah, a number exactly. of questions. Yeah, <laughs> um, we have a number number of questions coming in um, from attendees. The first one that popped into the chat box is just a quick question from Carl. Um, do mice and shrimp live in groups, sort of like colonies, or are they spread out uh, in many areas? So that's a really good question. Um, it depends on on the species. And so if, if, I'm, we're, if we're talking about mycids in the Caribbeans, they are actually, they form swarms and that's how they, they move. Um, here in Lake Champlain at the very bottom of the lake, we see them all spread out. And so like they're just swimming around. Um, so yeah, so they're kind of just all spread out. They're just swimming around, but like, I mean, they are together, but their, their distribution is, I guess it would be like, you can find them at, uh, it depends on the lake depth, but I would say that they're not, like tightly grouped together. If that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, another question from Lisa. Um, hi, Rosie. Uh, we were wondering, do you pull up other things when you sample with the benthic sled? Uh, what are some other things you've pulled off the bottom of lakes with, with the benth benthic sled? That's a very good question. So in Lake Ontario, so 
here in Lake Champlain, so we have zebra mussels and they don't go as deep as quagga mussels. So they're, they have a fairly different distribution. So when I'm, I'm sampling in Lake, in Lake Ontario, we just pull up the benthic sled is full of, like filled with, with quagga mussels. Like sometimes it's even, like we have to pull it up really, really careful because it's so heavy. And so Lake Ontario is definitely like filled with, with, with quagga mussels. And it depends on, on the, at what depth we are. Sometimes we'll have, um, we'll, pu we'll pull up a couple amphipods, the different other chronomids, the different other organisms that are with, with, you know, with the, with the quagga mussels, but usually it's, it's quagga mussels. And it depends what gear we use. Like some, there's also like, we could take a ponar, which is kind of a grab that gets deployed. And, and sometimes we use that and it just kind of grabs onto like the sediment and pulls it up. And that's where you can see different other organisms. Great, thank you. Um, here's another uh, multi-part big question from, from John. Um, so aside from today, Zuma scientist, um, how does your uh, very important research reach uh, decision makers um, regarding sort of the importance of climate change's impact on food webs and maybe some other impacts on food webs that you're seeing? Um, and what can K-12 students or just young people in general do to help, help spread the word? That's a very, very important question. I think it's, it's so important to, you know, think about it, you know, when, when I, when I give these presentations, it's more like kind of I have to realize that there's a very large, a very broad spectrum. And so um, one of the things is that, so, you know, there's like in Lake, in the Great Lakes, in Lake Champlain, so there's fish of not only ecological importance, but also um, economic. So like many people depend on them. And so without, it's like, like a kind of a, a domino effect. And so we have big fish that, are, are, are we have like lake trout that are really important. And so mycids, um, they are an important food source for, for fish that it's kind of like a, so like juvenile lake trout will feed on, on mycids, but we also have like prey fish, like um, rainbow smelt and um, alewife. And so if this, if this component takes, if we take this mycid component away, then it can, I mean, we, we could expect it to in some way affect dynamics in food webs. And so we, I, I would say that in some systems, it depends on what system, mycids in a way kind of, if you remove mycids, the, the, there, there has to be some sort of a food web crash or, you know, like it's, it's that impactful. Um, I would say that it's important for students to understand that like climate change and, and impacts that we see is not the only factor that can affect a food web. And so there's different factors, different things that come into play that, you know, that can make something happen. And so in this case, we have invasive species. So like something really important is to say, you know, don't be introducing, you know, some people just go and introduce an organisms because they think, oh, maybe they'll survive, but they don't have, they don't know the impact that it could have. And so kind of, looking at in terms of like how we can teach students um, on mycids and like how this is a, a larger. I think it's, it's that in, in my research, mycids, it's you know, what I'm passionate about, what is important here in Lake Champlain. But I think the underlying uh, importance of it is that the importance of, of understanding balance and understanding that in every food web you have, that everything plays an important role. Um, and not only is, cl is climate change algal blooms or different factors altering that, but maybe some, and most of the time is kind of the addition of different factors. Hope I was able to, um, to answer the question. I really liked your answer. I think, uh, yeah, being able to speak to and articulate sort of the systems implications of, of some of these issues that, that we're researching, studying and talking about, right? And everyone has their entry point. You know, you mentioned sort of the economic and cultural significance of Lake Champlain, the basin, different organisms, and, you know, almost any of these impacts 
uh, or potential impacts that we're tracking, you can trace back to someone's connection, whether it be, you know, as an angler or as someone who gets economic or spiritual or cultural, you know, uh, propping up uh, from some particular resource. You know, you can always draw those connections. You can talk about it in terms of food web. You can talk about it in terms of dollars. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely appreciate okay. the answer. <laughs> so thank you. Um, let's do uh, a question from Laura. Um, is there evidence that zebra mussels have impacted mycids or other plankton populations in Lake Champlain? So yes, I think so what, how we can determine whether or not zebra mussels have an impact is um, not only that water clarity has increased. And so, at, you know, just overall, you'll see that if you take away some organisms, then the structure of other organisms that are depending it, like their size structure will, will shift. And so there has been evidence that this has basically in a way altered that. Um, zebra mussels are more shallow than, than let's say quagga mussels. So quagga mussels, you'll find them more deep. And so how basically there's, in, here in Lake Champlain, we'll see that more of an impact in shallower sites. Um, so our, our food web has been changing because of all the, these invasive species and not only zebra mussels, also um, other invasive species such as um, um, bithotrephes, which is our um, different zooplankton. And I can I can share some more information on on that. Yeah, that would be great. Um, you can send some resources um, my way for sure, and I'll I'll communicate them out. We have a place on the website where we kind of share follow up resources from presentations, um, so you can find them there, Laura. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to to share some things um, following up, or um, we'll provide Rosie's email in just a second. So um, if folks have follow-up questions, they can contact um, Rosie directly for sure. I uh, hope that's okay. <laughs> um, great. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, we're gonna do one more quick question um, before we jump into a feedback poll and share a take-home activity. So um, please stick with us, folks. Um, Rosie, a uh, uh, question from Adrin, who I think was one of the participants from Texas today. So maybe you, you know uh, who this is, but um, they're asking, where do you see your future research directions going uh, regarding mycids? And what larger implications do they have for the area surrounding Lake Champlain? That's a really good question. Um, so I think that as far as um, my career path, I, I would like to continue conducting research on mices. I think that is my calling and I'm, I, I, would, I would like to be one of those scientists, you know, that can't retire in 60 or 64 years because they're so passionate about what they do. But I also see myself uh, more into like environmental policy. I think that, you know, we need more people that, that A, that, you know, can best assess these policies. Um, and not a lot of, like, you know, when you're in the boat and you're out and having fun and you're doing what you love and it's important, it's some, I mean, it's a great way of spending my life, but I also think that, you know, kind of advocating for, for what's, for, as scientists, we believe, I think is important as well. Um, as far as, uh, can you repeat the follow-up question? I think there was a, a second part question to that. Um, yeah, uh, just asking sort of what larger implications um, mycids have for the area surrounding Lake Champlain. And we kind of touched on that in, in many ways already, but I don't know if you have any final thoughts in terms of, um, you know, the yeah. implications of mycids in the region. Yeah, so I think that um, ultimately it's kind of, it, there's different ways you can look at it. You know, as an ecologist, I care about the lake itself. Um, some people might care about, you know, just larger fish. They, they might, you know, it's like my sit is not really that important for me. Well, it is because that's what your fish eat, you know? And so um, ultimately I think it depends on, on who you are and, and what your values are. And so if it is, if you just want to see your lake healthy, because, you know, that's, that's where you grew up and that's, um, and that's what kind of what you like, you know, that, that could be it. I've seen definitely people approaching me saying, Hey, 
like you know I've seen this part of the lake being very green I don't like that like do you have any ideas you know when I just go out and, and it's just like some people like are very invested in 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 their lake because they care about it and so I think it all everything is collect is, is connected that's great um Thanks, Rosie. Uh, so that was our, our last question. I wanted to get through them all because I, I think thought we had enough time. Um, if you have any follow up questions for Rosie, um, we're going to share. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, again, and uh, you should see uh, Rosie's email pop up there. So you can jot that down. Um, Ashley should be dropping Rosie's email address uh, in the chat box as well in just a moment. Um, we're gonna go ahead now and launch a feedback poll. Um, so if y'all could take a moment um, to fill out that feedback poll, that's super helpful for us as we sort of gauge, uh, you know, virtual learning and what we're doing with Zuma Scientist um, and kind of keeping track of how things are going. So I'll let that run for, for just a minute. Um, please do uh, fill that out, it's super helpful for us. Um, and then uh, once some folks have started answering, I'll move on and share uh, today's take home activity. Um, great. Yeah, so it looks like folks are, are answering there. If for some reason the feedback poll isn't coming up for you, um, or if you have something else uh, you'd like to say about today's presentation, feel free to, to drop your thoughts into the chat box. Um, so uh, as a take home activity today, uh, Rosie and I uh, thought it would be fun for you all to draw a food web for Lake Champlain. So definitely include mycids, uh, include some of the other organisms you learned about today and that were mentioned, or maybe you know about or care about or have some connection to in Lake Champlain. Um, so there's a little, a little quick link to a wiki how on you know how to draw a food web you know sort of what to include those producers those primary consumers those secondary and tertiary consumers uh, so go ahead and uh, go go to that link uh, check out sort of a step-by-step -step how to draw a food web uh, maybe you want to go to the youtube channel go back to the beginning of rosie's presentation and and think about some of the other organisms uh, you want to include uh, and once you draw your food web if you want to share uh, share what you've made with us on instagram you can see our instagram handle down there uh, on the bottom at lake champlain sea grant or share them with us on facebook as well um, and i just uh, finally want to share uh, next week's presentation. Um, so please do join us. Uh, Tuesday is our final Zuma Scientist session. Um, we have one more uh, event coming up after that. Actually, sorry, we have two more Zuma Scientist sessions, uh, two more next week, Tuesday and Friday. And then uh, we have a trivia night planned. So stay tuned um, for that. So uh, next Tuesday, we have Jeff Whipple from uh, Vermont State, uh, who's a Vermont State Game Warden joining us um, at noon next week. Uh, you should see a link in the chat to our virtual learning page to register, as well as a link to our YouTube channel um, to, to view previous Zuma Scientist presentations. Um, so I hope to see some of you joining us uh, next week as well for Jeff and for subsequent uh, presentations. Uh, Rosie, big thank you again to you. Uh, I learned a ton. Uh, I hope other folks did as well. Um, seems like they had some good questions coming in. Um, so seriously, thank you. Uh, it's great to have you. Um, yeah, just a uh, pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, hope to see you all uh, soon. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Rosie.